Good morning and uh, welcome to Greenway Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Darrell. This morning we've had some really inclement weather. We've had a lot of snow, but then we had a lot of ice in on top of it and it really made the roads very difficult. So this morning I'm going to be with you and we're going to finish up the study that we've been doing in Lamentations. Lamentations, uh, a lament, uh, a, a very heartfelt, mournful dirge. A uh, poetic cry out to the injustices, to the to the terrible things that have gone on in Jerusalem, and we have been. There's five chapters in Lamentations. We're going to be finishing that up today. So as you join with me, as we finish off this study in Lamentations, I hope that you've been able to get something out of it. I hope that you've been able to put yourself into it. I pray that you have felt the urgency of change inside of us that God requires, not that we require of ourselves all the time. As a matter of fact, sometimes we don't want change. We want things to go on just the way that they are or else get back to the way they were. That's not what God wants from us. So this morning, if you will pray with me and then we will begin our last Sunday in the book of Lamentations, what we've been calling a Hebrew elegy. Of course, elegy being a, a mournful, uh, poetic writing. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. No matter what takes place around us, no matter what goes on in the world, you are in charge and you have placed us into your hands. You have given us the opportunity to serve and to know you. And you have given us your voice. You have spoken to us and through us to others to tell about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's what this is about. Father, that's what Lamentations is about, is about getting away from you, but then drawing near to you and the results of that. Father, as we open up this book, as people listen from their homes, as we open up our hearts to hear from you, God, would you please speak to us let us hear you and then let us be changed forever by you. In Christ we pray, amen, amen. Lamentations, wonderful book. I had never preached out of it and I had studied it um, to, to, to present this and to, to learn from it. You know, I, I, everything that I present, everything that I speak on or preach on or give talks on or whatever is something that's gone through me first. So it's been my joy it's been my joy to read Lamentations and, and to, to look back on what had happened after, after King Josiah uh, had had such a great reign in Jerusalem. And then it was just all downhill from there. And the writer Jeremiah wrote the book of Jeremiah preceding Lamentations. And he talks about how they have to return to the Lord and they need to do the things that the Lord would re require of them. And, and then Lamentations is what he wrote after the terrible, terrible sieges and, and destruction uh, in Jerusalem in 587. And so we started in, in Lamentations 1 and talked about how lonely the city sat without her, her greatness and, and everything else. And we, we also talked about the, 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 as it went through and how they cried out and they realized that we have failed God. And the, re and the reason that we have calamity on us is because God loves us, okay? So if somebody loves you and they want to have the best things for you, if you're going into a bad direction, they will do what they can in order to fix your, or to correct that direction and to go back in a proper way. God created us for a relationship with us. God created us for a relationship with him, excuse me. And he calls us into a loving productive, honoring, and glorifying relationship for his good pleasure. And so sometimes, being the children that we are, we do go through things that are difficult. And we do go through things that maybe that we, as a people, deserve. So this morning, we're going to be in Lamentations chapter 5. And we're going to kind of go through it and finish up this beautiful, eloquent study on Lamentations. 
Now, Lamentations was written in, in an acrostic, okay? It'd be like us saying A, B, C, D, and everything starts with A. Uh, always we have gone B, but before we had left, C, come with us and go, D, our you know, destination is with, you know, whatever. That's the acrostic. And that's what's happened here in Lamentations. And it started out in verse one with the acrostic starting with Aleph, Beth, Beth, Dalid, Gamal, you know, Gamal, Dalid, you know, I better watch out. I don't know my Hebrew really well. And, and, it, and it goes down the Hebrew alphabet or Aleph, Bet, I guess with them. Um, and, and it starts each verse of course, they didn't write it in verse. Uh, they wrote it in, in a poetic dirge and, and poetry. But it comes out to 22 lines in, in, in uh, chapter one. And then it goes to chapter two and it does the same thing. But in chapter three, it does something different. It goes from, from just a couple lines starting with Aleph. It goes to three lines starting with Aleph. So instead of having 22 verses like we had in Chapter one, chapter two. In Lamentations three, we had 66. And then last week we went to Lamentations four and it had again 22. And this time in Lamentations five, there is no acrostic. It does not have that kind of order that we've been used to in reading this. Why did they use acrostics? Many people wonder um, what, why the writer used an acrostic here. Uh, acrostic could have been used as a, a, as a memory device. Uh, you, you remember uh, many people uh, couldn't read or write, and many could, uh, but it was an oral tradition. They would sit around and they would relate these stories to each other. They would relate these lamentations. As a matter of fact, Jews have re repeat this every year, the lamentation. Um, and so maybe it was to help them to memorize or maybe it was to help show us the structure, the well thought out. You know, sometimes when we get angry, we fly off the handle or when we get uh, frightened, we fly off the handle. But when, when we see this structure right here, it's pretty easy as for us to tell that this was very well thought out, that this was, wasn't just a, a momentary outburst of, of, of pinning down thoughts. No, this was a a thoughtful writing down of an exterior hideous thing and the interior thought process about it. When we go into chapter five, there is no acrostic. I don't know why. I'm gonna guess maybe it shows a, a crescendo and a collapse. I, I don't know, maybe uh, in, from chapter one and chapter two and then chapter three with its 66 lines that all start with an acrostic and then it starts going back and then it collapses. Maybe it's inside of us, that structure. Maybe God's speaking to us. This is kind of one of the ways he spoke to me about this is that we have our ways of doing things. We have our structure. We have our day in, day out. And God doesn't necessarily want us to hold fast to our day in, day out. He wants us to hold fast to him. And it could be that he was showing in this structure that all structures, when all structures are taken away, what remains? God, God. Wow. Today, there's a lot of things going on in our world and, and we want to see some change. We want to see change. We want to see things different than the way that we are. We see loved ones that are suffering. We see loved ones that are very concerned, that have some people have had people that have passed away that are in hospitals or in, in, in sick beds right now. We, we want to see things change. And as a matter of fact, before the pandemic, before all these things were going on, we, we, some, some people had to have change in their lives. They had destructive lifestyles. And they were made into correction. And, you know, I've read this a, a, a thousand times. I, I bet you have too, is the serenity prayer. And it was written by uh, Reinhold Niebauer. And it says, Niebauer, and it says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things that I can and wisdom to know the difference. And that, that sounds very comforting. And we use it as a very comforting uh, uh, poem, line help. But that's not the way Nebar wanted us to read it. 
He wasn't saying that, you know, God grant me the serenity and then give me peace and then never have, you know, difficulty again. But it says the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. No, it was not to meant to be a comfort, but a, to confront, to confront us in our thought processes to say, <clears throat> how do you look at your life? Do you look at your life as complete? Do you look at your life as the way that you want it to be? Do you want it to? Well, if it is fine and dandy, but look around you. And if the world is the way that you want it to be and the world is uh, in, in perfect harmony with it, with with God's will, then you might not be looking at the world properly because the world properly is not in God's will. And so instead of saying grant us the serenity. We need that peace. We need the peace of God. We don't need to be anxious for anything it says in scripture, but we need the peace that only he can give us. But it also says the courage to change the things that we can. That not only means the things that are extant and around us, the things that are happening in politics or government or health or economics, or whatever, it doesn't matter. No, it's also talking about what we can change inside of ourselves. What can we change inside of ourselves and the courage and the wisdom to know the difference of the things that I can change about myself and the things that I cannot change about myself. The things that I can be active in in the world and the things that there is no way under God's green earth that I can make changes in the world. After Josiah's wonderful reign and the collapse we have read through Lamentations how miserable life became in Jerusalem, how difficult it came in Jerusalem. We can read back in the, the, the Kings and the Chronicles. We can read back in other uh, literature that's been around. We can read in other literature about how things had collapsed in Jerusalem and how difficult it had become and how difficult their neighbors were on them. You know, it's always good whenever we are hurt or we're broken down on a vehicle or we're doing a job or something like that that requires more than one person that somebody come alongside of us and help us. But doesn't it make it worse whenever somebody, like say you're stuck in the snow this morning and hopefully by the time you listen to this, uh, you've been home and you didn't listen, you, you, you're not stuck in the snow and you're stuck in the snow trying to get out, somebody goes by and throws a snowball at you or something. You know, that's just, uh, that's just heaping on top of you. Well, that's what was happening to the, these poor people in Jerusalem is that their neighbors also were heaping on top of them. And so what we've seen here is from Josiah's reign, from somebody reigning and following hard after God to a destruction of a people who had very, very poor leadership and very, very poor followership. You know, sometimes we want to blame leaders for everything, but you know what? Sometimes, and I include myself in it, sometimes we need to look and see how we are following after our leaders. How are we following after God's will? How are we following after, you know, if we get a ticket driving down the road and it's because we're speeding, there, there's nothing we should be angry about, is there? We broke the law. And so knowing that, um, uh, that's bad followership when it comes to rules and regulations. Um, so yeah, some of us have had bad leadership. Some of us consider the leadership we have now bad on every on, on many levels. I'm not talking about so much politics and just. But no, sometimes it's the way we follow as well. Sometimes it's the way that uh, inside of us things are clicking and going on in our minds and. We need to change inside, it says to us. And it says in chapter five of Lamentations, starting with verse five, it said, remember, O Lord, what has befallen, befallen us. Look and see our disgrace. And, and it's not just um, calling, calling out to God to say, look at what's going on with us or look at, look, at, look at us, but it's also an inward expression. Look at our disgrace. We have gone from very great to not so good. And in our lives, if you remember when you first started crying, following Christ, when you were first a God follower and how maybe you lived way up on a mountain with God. And then through the years, as things went on, you started taking things either for granted or you started getting angry and saying, where is God? Or the preceding, why do I need God? 
He's there. He's like the, the good puppy that you reach down and you pet. He's like gold that we talked about last week, how, how dimly it had grown with these people, the things that were important, they had changed. And so sometimes we treat God that way and he calls out to God to look at us. And he says on into verse six, it says, We've given, we have given the hand to Egypt and to Assyria to get bread enough. We have no longer started trusting God for our daily bread. We started trusting other people. Egyptians, they used to be in, in, in slave, slavery under Egypt. Uh, Assyria had, it, it comes in and, and attacks and kills and, and takes away. And they're, and they're reaching out to these people for their daily bread. And of course they had to in order for them to eat, but it's also a picture. It's a picture that they were longing for and trusting in the things of this world to get their daily bread there to get what they needed to go daily through and not trusting in God. And it goes on to say that and, and that we get our bread at the peril of our lives in verse nine because of the sword in the wilderness. And I, I was reading that and I thought, how many people right now are having to go to work day in, day out, and they're fearful. They're fearful for their lives. They're fearful for their health. They're fear, fearful for their well-being because they're having to go out into a contaminated, fallen, broken world, not just of the pandemic, not just of a virus, but of people. And people are afraid to go to work, to go to school, to go to places because of other people and their behavior and the way that they're acting. And it's unconscionable that we would be harming or, or stirring up dissent and, and anxiousness among each other instead of helping and encouraging each other. And it goes on to say, men are compelled to grind at the mill. They got to go to work in verse 13. In verse 14, it says, and the old men have left the city gate, the place where we expect people of leadership to be found, where you can go and you can walk. Man, if you try and go to a licensed bureau or different things like that at some points in this pandemic, you weren't able to. They were closed up. The doors were closed. I, I found a sign that got blown off of a, a, on, a, on a road the other day. And so I carried it to the uh, to uh, the utilities department or whatever it is over there, public works department over there off 421. And, and I tried to call them, nobody would answer. I get a, it said, if you have anything, just leave a message and we'll get back with you. So I just took the sign and I just set it out there by their door and said, well, they got to come in and out of the door eventually. But nobody was going to, the people weren't coming to the gate in order to do business, to talk about things in this world, to schools, look at everything. Right now, people are just kind of, hunkered down in some ways and, and we're not able to interact in the way that we were. And so what has happened? What we have known in the past has changed. What has gone on in the past is not the current in a lot of different ways. Exterior, exteriorly and interiorly, things have changed. And so our life that we had before, when everything was going good and everything was going grand, uh, although not in the direction that God wanted it to be, God stepped in and he spoke to his children in calamity. He's spoken to us in difficulty. He's spoken to us in different ways that have made us wake up and at least take an accounting of our lives. And in verse eight, uh, 15, it says, our dancing, our dancing has been turned to mourning. Our dancing has been turned to mourning. The good life that we've had, the joys that we've had, the things that we're able to do, the freedoms that we enjoyed, the plenty that we enjoyed, the, all many of those things have been put on hold or eliminated. It breaks my heart when we talk when they talk on the news or read uh, how many different businesses may never recuperate, may never start back up again and it will be a whole nother generation of people that will have to start filling in the nooks and crannies of the businesses that will no longer be able to um, go on and so we look back on that and, and it's it's heartbreaking for many people who've lost so much money or or lost their livelihood or or are broken but but we're looking forward to open 
things opening back up. We're, we're looking for not to be the same that we were, but maybe things start opening back up to where we can start doing commerce again, to where the leaders and the elders and the businessmen can start, and women, can sit at the gates of the city, metaphorically speaking. They can be in the city and we can start doing business. But have we changed? Have we recognized maybe, just maybe, that God was calling out to us not to continue business as usual, but maybe business in a new way inside of us. You know, there has to be an interior change. Even if things change uh, on the outside, on the inside, things have to change. There was a story, and I checked on this story to make sure it was true whenever I read it, however long ago that was. In Memphis, there was this guy named Matt White, and Matt White went to the grocery store to buy uh, food. He went to Kroger's or something in, in Memphis, and while he was there, he went outside, and there was a young man that approached him, and the young man said, sir, he said, can I carry your groceries for you? And if, if you, I'll carry your groceries for you if you just buy me a, a box of donuts. I'm hungry. And the man said, yeah. I'll do that. And he helped him to his car, got him in. He goes, now do you one better. Let's go back in and let me buy you some food. And so they got to know each other. And the young man started telling him about his life. His name was uh, Chauncey Jones Black. He started telling him about his life and about how difficult things were. His mother was on disability. They didn't have any food in the house. They didn't have any, you know. And so as he's telling him this, and this guy, Matt, who, who is fairly well off, I think, I think he, uh, you know, had resources, I'll put it that way. He's a music director, had a degree in music. He was a music director at uh, Fair, I think Fairchild, or Fairfield uh, Productions in Memphis, Tennessee. You can look it up. You can look the story up if you want to and Google it or what have you. And uh, so as they were talking with each other, this young man was telling me these things. And so this Matt guy says, I'm not going to put you on the bus. I want to carry you home. And he took him home. And sure enough, things were just the way that the young man had said, that there was no, there was very little furniture. There was no food in the house. There was, you know, it was a, a difficult situation. So this, 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 also this young guy, Matt White, started a GoFundMe page. And to help this family out. And they raised almost $340,000 for them. They got him into a different home in a better place in town. They, they got him into a, uh, um, a better situation monetarily. They paid off some debts and did other things. But unfortunately, for this young man who had been put into an impoverished situation when he was a child, didn't really know how to react when he had things. And unfortunately, over the period of over a little over two years, the police were called to their new home some 53 times. And in the end of, I think it was the end of 2019 or the beginning of 2020, somebody drove by their home, he and his brother were outside and shot at them and they returned fire. Uh, it was a drive-by shooting, they returned fire and unfortunately, one of their neighbors, a young man named Caleb Wakefield was outside and got hit with a bullet and died. And so this young man, Chauncey Black, uh, had to, to uh, go into the court system, um, charged with second degree murder. And they said that, you know, he, he, was, he had some opportunities. He was given opportunities, but he shunned those opportunities for an old way of life. Now, I don't know his situation. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know the intricacies and the, and the, the specificities of his life, but I do know this, that having given an opportunity to make a change, I'd say if the police were at my house 53 times in less than two or three years, then that would indicate a problem that there was no interior change. The address changed, but the interior didn't change. And so I hope and I pray for him I hope and I pray that something good has happened for him, but I hope and pray also for us that as we've gone through these difficult times, as we've gone through times that are uh, not the way that we want them, that maybe we have done a little retro introspection and that we have looked at our lives and held them up against the mirror of what God wants us to be and we have probably found ourselves wanting. I know that I have. And so no matter what your address is, everywhere you go, there you're going to be. I've said that to a thousand people, I'll bet. And I've had to say that to myself as well. Anywhere I go, 
there I am going to be. And so what do I need to do? I need to reflect. I need to reflect. And as we finish Lamentations, as we have read here that, that what Jeremiah said that, look, Lord, what's, what's befallen us. Well, we have to put, we've been putting our trust in Egypt and Assyria for our daily bread and, 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 and our dancing has been turned to mourning. And then it goes into verse 16. This is very, very telling. It says, the crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. The crown has fallen from our head. And that's in verse 16. Why was there a crown on their head to start with? It's figurative, obviously. They didn't have a literal crown. But what it is, I believe, is that we place ourselves in a place of authority. We have certain responsibilities in life, but we also then take and assume authority for those things. And when we take authority for things that go on in our lives and we take it out of the one whose hands the authority should be in for our lives, then we start to get into trouble. That we start looking at our lives and saying, I am the captain of my ship, right? Uh, not necessarily so. As Christ followers, God is in control. And we, as followers of Jesus Christ, we, we place ourselves in his worthy hands. And then we want to, through our lives, bring him honor and glory. Uh, you know, not a, a, a life that's, that's been cast onto Christ for all things results in works. But our works don't necessarily result in following after Christ. Hope you followed what I'm saying there. That sometimes whenever we work like Christ followers, we, and, and many of us have done that in our lives. We have been missionaries or we've done good things or we've you know, helped people or we've done, but our works don't necessarily equate to a true follow worship of Christ. But a true followership of Christ will lead us to a changed life and to works that show that we want to bring honor and glory to the one that has saved us. And so Jeremiah's writing here, he's saying that the crown has fallen from our head. We are no longer looking at ourselves as royalty, as the ones that, the, that, that are in authority. That's, gee whiz, since I have to take responsibility for everything in my life, I should have some authority. I should have some choice. You do. I'm a very existential Christian in a, good, in a good way. I believe that our decisions mean things. I believe that when we decide to do things, that there are results from it, good and bad. But we are to follow after God. And then it goes on to say, but in verse 19, it says, but you, O Lord, reign forever. In other words, the crown that's on God's head is there because it's supposed to be. You, O oh Lord, reign forever. The, the crown has fallen from our head. The rusty, dusty, minimized crown built of garbage has fallen off of our heads. The crown of thorns was placed on our Christ. He paved a way for us to walk in relationship with God. And if we do not take the crown of thorns off of Christ and put the, crane, the crown of deity on him that is truly, truly warranted, then our lives are just good works that will lead to nothing. Whereas our following after Christ leads to our works for him. But it says here, but you, O Lord, you reign forever. You are the one that that deserves our, our praise. You're the one that deserves our honor. Your book, your will, the, the Holy Spirit that indwells us and gives us direction and understanding and comprehension. You, O oh Lord, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross to pay the sin, debt, the penalty of our sins. You, O oh Lord, are the only one that's worthy to wear the crown, the crown that lasts in eternity. And it's a figurative crown. It says that we are a crowning glory of God, that we are the works of his hands, of his spoken word, of his, of his love and of his grace. And he wants to work through us. But unfortunately, man has fallen uh, quite a ways. Reinhold 
Niebauer had that quote that uh, I, I said earlier, Grant, God, grant me the serenity to accept things that I cannot change, courage to change the things that I can, the wisdom to know the difference. He also wrote this, man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible. Man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible, but man's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. Just as our comprehension and our capacity, because we're made in the image of God, to be just does not mean that we are going to ask, act in a just way. So even though we were, are made with the capacity for justice and therefore a capacity for democracy, our inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. Because left on our own devices, we will go the wrong way. We will do things that are arrogant and ignorant. We will do things that are pursuing our own best interests and not the interests of others. And if you look at this right here, that's going to be us. That's going to be me forever. I will always, I will always teeter on that edge with you between doing what I want to do and what God wants me to do. But he's given me the capacity to understand his justice, which is true justice, his judgment, which is true judgment, which leads us into a life with him. And you know, it finishes off by this in verse 21. I'm, just, I'm gonna finish with this. It said, restore to us yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Restore us to yourself. Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. The only way that we can be fixed, the only way that we can see that we need to walk towards perfection, not that we will ever be perfected, but we, we mature and we walk towards perfection. The only way that we can do that is to ask God to restore us. And when I talk about restoration, I don't mean some cheap restoration. I had uh, friends one time that, that uh, they had a 53 or a 54 Chevrolet and they painted it, spray can painted it because they wanted it to look nice. Man, let me tell you what, that was a bad wreck. That did not look really that nice. And, and there's other people that have gone to restore things, restore a clock or whatever, and it looks beautiful, but it doesn't work. You open it up and the insides aren't there. Uh, so many different restorations that people do. There's a, a, a commercial where a family has rented a VRBO, a vacation rental by owner, and they go to it and it looks great on the outside. They open it up and it's like a Hollywood set. It was a great facade. But behind the facade was nothing. When we ask God to restore, to when we ask God to restore us to Himself, God restores completely. He doesn't just do it with a can of spray paint. He doesn't just do it with a Hollywood uh, facade, a movie, a movie set. He comes inside of us and that's where he starts. Not on the outside. He starts on the inside, deep down. And he starts showing us where we are at fault. Why we need restoration. Why that we've put a crown on our heads that doesn't belong. Why that we have been rebellious against God. Why that all these things that we have been talking about for weeks are, well, it's made our... The things that we find important grow very dim. The gold has grown dim. The luster of this world has grown strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so that's what we need to do. We need to ask God for the restoration that only he can bring us. And the waiting that they had in the Old Testament for the Messiah, the anointed one to come, the actual arrival of God on earth, Emmanuel, God with us, of Jesus Christ, who gave himself as the only sacrifice that God could accept. He could only accept the creative aspect of himself and re-begin. He, he offered himself on the cross, that, that creative God, that restoring God, that loving God, that caring God, that wants us to be in a proper relationship with him, which means we need to stand in a proper relationship with our understanding. He wants to take all this calamity that he brings into our lives. He wants to take all the things that happen to us, the experiences, good and bad, and he wants to reflect it on himself. He wants to be glorified. He wants the honor. And so when we think about these things, when we think about being truly restored back to God, 
We need to think of it in a way that wrought change in our lives and change in the world around us. Because if not, if we come out of the other side of just calamity and difficulty and, and challenges, we just come out the other side going, I have, I have stood up now and I, I have been able to make it. I have stood up against the wind and the rain and, and I, have, I have faced it. Everywhere you go, there you're going to be. And if God hasn't started the cleansing process on the inside, the restoration process on the inside of you, then you become something that might be flashy on the outside, but nothing on the inside. True restoration comes from God alone. True restoration is in Christ. If I can do anything for you, if anything in my life can reflect or my experiences can give you an encouragement and I can talk to you about that, I want to do that. If there's anything that somebody in your life that you know follows hard after Christ can do for you to make you see more clearly and understand better what it means to be restored back to the walk that God wants for you, I beg you to talk to them. Do not put it off. Go to them and ask them, contact me and I will sit down with you if possible. I will talk to you. I will Zoom with you. I will do all the things that God has given us. Man, he's given us a lot of ways. Even this right now, this Mevo camera, this, this that we can pop it on uh, Facebook and YouTube and, and email it out like we do. Uh, it, it's fantastic. But this is not the way I want to be. This is not what I want. I want to be back in relationship and, and tangible relationship with God's people, with his community, because it's my community and it's from him. And so we look for the good stuff, the real good stuff, not the facade, not the shiny, not the glittery. We look for the good stuff, and that is to be in relationship with God and relationship with his people. Well, people, God bless you. And I pray that your day goes well but I pray that we listen to what God has spoken to us through lamentations, that we listen to what calamity and to difficulties and all that, what it can mean in a Christ follower's life. It can mean resolution inside of ourselves, a resolve about who we are, what we have done, that we have rebelled. Even as Christ followers, we rebel. And as we rebel, God starts to correct his children. And even sometimes our relationships become very broken with God, even as Christ followers. But he wants to restore that back to the original plan, to the original relationship that he wanted with us. And that's what we're walking to now. We're in eternity now, but we walk towards that relationship with God that will be completely restored one day that we read about on the other end of scripture. Now, actually, we read about it all through scripture. But we just say this morning, come Lord Jesus. Come now in our lives. Let us hear from you. Come now, Lord Jesus, to bring an end to all things that are calamitous, that are injurious, that are broken. We ask him to come and fix all things. Father, we pray to you right now that you would do that for us, that you would look, we would allow you to look deep into our lives because we have committed ourselves to you that we have opened ourselves up like a book. And, and the place of authority that we've given ourselves, the, the fake crowns and everything that we put over us in our lives have fallen off. And Father, we have seen more clearly and recognized more understandably that you are the only one that can wear a crown. Restore us to yourself, oh Father. Bring us back to a relationship with you. Bring us back into a relationship with each other, the church, the people of God here and all around the world. Father, give us the strength and the courage to change the things that we can. But Father, <laughs> to recognize the things that we can't. Father, we know that we are fallen people. And we know that we need you, that only you can answer the questions that we have. In Christ we pray. I mean, God bless you all. I, I pray that this has been an encouragement to you. Um, as we go into next month, uh, I, I look forward to what God has for us. If I can pray for you, if I can stand with you, if I can do anything for you, if I can point you into a direction, let me know. It would be my honor in Christ, his, in his name. Amen.